Now I'm recording. What's up, Rebs? Andy McCabe here, your Restoration Rebel leader of sorts. This is the 5th of July, 2023, which is just nuts. 2023 got here way before I was ready. So we're going to start off like we always start it with the agreements. Agreement number one, I will protect the value of my services. Offering free services only serves to erode the value of similar services industry-wide. Agreement number two, I will practice incredible transparency. I will explain the claim process in detail to my clients. I will not hide pricing details or falsify reports. I will never communicate with an adjuster without also communicating with my client. Agreement number three, I do not believe in competition. The restoration companies in my market are part of my community. I will be an active member of my community. It is our unbreakable unity that will create the change that we strive for. And number four, I am willing to walk away from any project, client, or contract that is not compatible with my values and stated mission. Amen. So speaking of community, you know, the restoration, co restoration companies uh, in my part of the world are less uh, less opt to agree with uh, <laughs> that that community uh, lack of competition. It seems like uh, guys in my market would just as soon uh, stab each other in the back than help each other out. But I did get a hold of a guy that started a company here in town, Masters of Disaster. Uh, I worked with uh, Nick uh, when I was at Service Master here in Bend, Oregon. One of the best uh, restoration technicians I've ever met in my life. Uh, but we reconnected on Friday. Hopefully he's in the group now. Somebody turned him into the group and, and said, you should be a member. And I saw his name. I was like, I re so I reached out. We connected on Friday morning. And by Friday afternoon, I had two huge jobs for him. Gigantic. One of them is going to be probably a $70,000 mitt. And the other one's going to be smaller. It's going to be $20,000 $20, mitigation. But just by virtue of picking up the phone, and calling me, he got instant work. And that's is that's how it works around here. We got to know each other. You got to get to know each other. Uh, we got Max. Max, get in here. And you don't know what you don't know, right? You don't, I mean, you may be busier than heck, and you're like, man, I don't know how I'm going to handle this stuff. No, Everyone else must be busy. But you don't know. You don't know that everyone is busy. You don't know that no one will loan you labor or work or whatever else um, if you need it. You only know by reaching out. So, you know, we're we're all busy right now. This 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 year started out with a bang. It is incredible. Um, we had this major nationwide freeze, and everyone is busy right now. My phones are ringing off the hook. We got new clients coming in every day. Uh, we're going to start writing some good sheets for new folks. I always like to see that, especially the first week of the year, onboarding new clients. Um, but everyone's busy. Uh, so reach out and help each other. We can get a whole lot more done together than we can uh, fighting each other for, for this perceived market share. Um, the reality is there will never be enough of us. And the market needs us more than we need the market. We just got to be realistic about it. About it so... Uh, Mr. Max, I had him on the phone yesterday. I'm trying to get you in here, Max. I hit this button here. Uh, yeah, Max was talking about getting on um, programs. He's he's brand new. He hasn't done any jobs yet, so he's 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 that new. But he's asking, well, how do we get on these insurance programs? And I said, no, 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 don't do it. Um, we can get more work. We can get enough work uh, without selling our souls to the proverbial devil. Um, then, yeah, then, then, then we need. We can get more work than we need. We don't need to get into bed with the carrier. So, Max, I see you got your notes there. That's awesome. Sure. You're just learning, man. You're just. This is a welcome to the, the Restoration University. This is uh, this is where it's at. Mr. Joe, tell us about that project you had in, in uh, uh, Churchill Downs. What, uh, that was a big one. It's 
I mean, it's about, they had 29 separate pipe freezes when the big storm. 29. So they're doing a remodel. They ripped the side off of this building. You're stalled out right now. Actually, everyone's stalled out right now. Let's see. I'll give it a second to catch We've up. Got... There we go. You're back. I'm back. I don't know who dropped out. Probably me. Oh, come on, people. Yeah, do I need to reconnect? I'm this is chunking out a little bit. Yeah, I think I need I need I need to connect differently. Hang on. We'll see. And while you're while you're so this 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 uh, Churchill Downs seven, how many many buildings on the property all facing uh, the track as it were and they were doing a remodel they ripped out the side of the building they didn't bother to put any insulation or siding back on the storm hit uh, and they had multiple pipe breaks 10 20 40 pipe breaks uh, so. Uh, Joe, you're still muted, but you went down there. You were given the unenviable task of Matterporting all these buildings, and uh, and you're almost done, but you're still you're still there. So, how's that going? Man, you're still it's dropping out. Am I am I dropping out? Raise raise your hands if I'm dropping out. Jen, Max, Rich, or is it just Joe? Kentucky, they don't believe in internet in Kentucky. Yeah. All right. You're crapping out. All right. We can circle back. We can circle back. Um, I had several questions uh, over this week about pricing. Um, one question just came up in the group. What can I charge for? Can someone send me a list of mitigation items that I'm allowed to charge for? Every time I read that phrase, I... I internally, I lose my freaking shit because we are not in a position to let any software or any carrier or any adjuster tell us what we are and are not allowed to charge for. If you've got a legitimate business, do a legitimate expense and a, you're performing legitimate activities, you charge for the freaking activity that you do. Uh, and if you want to take your pricing cues from Exactware, that's up to you. Uh, but the, the, the question of what we're allowed to You're charge for is just incredibly ridiculous. Mitch Stringer, come on, come on in. So along those veins, I want to read a sample uh, insurance policy where it tells us what we can and cannot charge for. It tells us how... Uh, how contractors and service providers are to behave. So let me show you that. And Jennifer knows where I'm going with this. It's kind of a trick question. It's kind of a trick. Where's my, where's this policy? I'm going to close this out. Make sure there's no name here. Andrew, you're. Am I really, am I really? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I'm going to make. I'm going to make somebody else host and then I'm going to chop off, jump off and jump back on and see, I'm going to make co-host. Yes. Now, congratulations, Mrs. Sterling. You are now co-host of this meeting and I'm going to drop off and see if, let me see here. Can I? Maybe I can't. No, I don't think I can. Not without losing the whole thing, we'll lose the feed, and I have to restart yeah, I the feed. I don't want to do that. So we're just gonna we're gonna soldier on. How about that? I'm gonna find this section. The section that you're looking for in any insurance policy is called duties after loss. So we're gonna go there. Duties. Nope. Okay, this is this is a crap. I don't have the right policy in front of me then. Nope, don't. I'm going to find a different insurance policy. So does anyone else have um, 
anything to say in the meantime. Rich, where are you from, man? We, we haven't spoken before. Oh, you're muted, though. So we're going to have to fix that. Fix, uh, unmute yourself here. Rich, unmute yourself. There you go. There you go. I'm in the Washington, D.C. area. I service Montgomery County is in uh, Howard County in Maryland. All right. You guys uh, busy as heck right now or not so much? Uh, yeah, I've wrapped up my floods uh, from the freeze. Just started another management company lost today. Uh, pretty busy for this time of year. I've been doing constantly got one, two floods going since November. And how many you say? One or two a week. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, for me, that's good. Um, you know, I only do around the average about 40 floods a year. Oh, that's not much. That's not many in the grand scheme of things. I'm a carpet cleaning car, uh, restoration guy. Okay. So I do 50 50. And uh, it's fun work. <laughs> it's hard work. Heard that. It is. Yeah, it's all fun work. Keeps us out of trouble. I'm trying to make my way through this farmer's insurance policy right now. Uh, to get where I need to see. Uh, so how'd you find uh, Rich? How'd you find us? How'd you how'd you get involved in this dirty five, little for, secret? What, years, five years. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, I haven't been in the I haven't been at the round table for a few months. I've been a little tied up. And no I one has. When I'm available. All right, good. I'm gonna go a different way here. I'm going to look for a policy that I can pull up and share. This is this will be good. So the the punchline of what I'm trying to get to is there is no statement, there's no law, there's no policy provisions that lay down any guidelines or rules to how restoration companies should operate and what they should charge, what they can and cannot charge for. There's no document in the land that says standard insurance claim handling rules, right? It's, it's very broad brush language that is used in these, in these documents. And unless an adjuster can tell me, can show me where in the policy or where, where in state law, it says I can and cannot charge for something, they're full of shit. When they tell me those things, uh, they're full of shit. When they say I can't charge more than what Xactimate says I can charge, uh, they're full of shit. When they say that I can't charge service call fees or I can't charge for overtime, um, the only place that uh, contractors have to abide by those rules are when they're stated rules in uh, in a TPA program. If you're part of the insurance program, you do have a set of rules you have to follow. There are things you can and cannot charge for. But outside of the programs, there is no such thing at all. I'm trying to find this, trying to I'm find back. this spot here. Say, oh, you're back. Can you hear me okay? I can now. I can now. Yeah, talk, I to me, I talk to us about uh, Kentucky. Talk to us about Churchill Downs while I'm trying to find this policy provision here. Well, I I gave it, I'm not talking too much in detail because I know they don't want me to. I mean, about 29 different spring line freezes um, from the fifth floor down into the basement ruptured and uh, total square foot of affected areas, about 350,000 square feet. We've got, we've got two semi-truck desiccants piping all the way through the stairwells, all the way up to the different floors. We're utilizing LGRs as well um, because the spaces are so big, you can't properly desiccant these buildings um, and every day we walk through it and we find more damage or more spots and little you know little key areas you know 20 square feet areas affected here and there but overall it's across about 350,000 square feet it's a beast of a job that's a lot of square feet yeah and my boss wanted me to matterport it for a prosperity stake to cover our butts and all that and Right now, like I'm the only one competent enough and also the only one that keeps the Matterport camera on me at all times. 
my my local guys down here have their camera, but they don't know where their tripod is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the other right now for the, our other big loss we're working on. So I'm stuck Matterporting this whole thing by myself. And to be, I mean, I did 176,000 square feet last weekend over 21 hours. And I was doing about 10 miles of walking each day. Yes, you were. So what do you figure your your guys' invoice? You're doing TNM. What do you think your what do you think your mitigation is gonna run? I'm gonna I'm th- if I was gonna throw a dart at the board, I'd say it's probably gonna at the end of the day be about 1.4. That's a good day's work. Yeah. Those are nice. And and when you come up with your invoice, that's gonna be the beginning of negotiations. That's not gonna be the end. Uh, Correct. It's going to take some time to get through that. Uh, so I want to review. Let's do a little policy review here. I'm going to share share this policy. Okay, this happens to be a State Farm insurance policy. So when you're when you're looking through policies, I don't advocate that any contractor really get into insurance policies because you're crossing a line. Um, you definitely can't talk policy language to any adjuster. You're not licensed appropriately to do that. Um, I happen to be because I'm a licensed adjuster. So I can, I can talk the talk as it were. So just be careful as contractors, be careful when you read these things, not to start quoting these things back to adjusters because they'll, they'll turn you into the state in a hot minute for uh, the unlicensed practice of public adjusting UPA. So here's, Duties after loss. Look at any policy is going to have this or something like this in it. Uh, after a loss, after a loss to which this insurance may apply, you must cooperate with us in the investigation of claim and also see that the following duties are performed. A, give us immediate notice uh, and also notify the police, notify the credit card companies. Okay. To protect property, you, you are obligated. Let's see. Your duties include B, protect the property from further damage or loss. That means perform mitigation. That means tear out dry, wet material before it becomes moldy material. Uh, that means you know, get things out of the muck that could be saved. If they stayed in the muck, they'd be you know permanently damaged, things like that. Make reasonable and necessary temporary repairs to protect the property. That's mitigation. Keep an accurate record of repair expenses. Did you read in those three sentences anywhere about use Xactimate pricing? No, you did not. Uh, I'm going to keep going here. Prepare an inventory of damaged or stolen property. Okay. Uh, As often as we require, exhibit the damaged property, provide us with requested records and documents, uh, give statements, submit to an examination under oath, that you know, may or may not have to do that. Um, produce employees, members of the household, or, you know, just essentially just let us investigate this claim. Uh, submit to us within 60 days after the loss, your signed sworn proof of loss that sets forth to the best of your knowledge and belief. This is interesting because it's this little section here on proof of loss. Most of the time says upon our request but this does not. Interesting, State Farm. Uh, So the proof of loss, it says what needs to be in the proof of loss and and things like that. That is it. Now I'm going to go to how claims are settled. I'm going to keep going here. No. Okay, there's the appraisal clause. Suit against us. Liability. Where is the how... Losses are settled. Conditions, nope. Conditions, nope. Uh, nope. No, nope. I'm keeping going here. Policy provisions. I'm just going to do a search for settle. I was going to say that. Get the words out of my mouth. Uh, increased, uh, nope. Loss settlement. Let's do, let's do a search for that. Settlement. Let's do that. Lost settlement page 19. Okay, we'll go to page 19.
Okay. We will settle covered property losses according to the following. Dwelling, replacement cost, loss, settlement, similar construction. We will pay the cost to repair or replace with similar construction and for the same use on the premises shown in the declarations here, coverages page, the damaged property covered. Um, and that is it. We will pay the cost to repair or replace with similar construction or for the same use. That is it. I'm not re I'm going to skim down here. Pretty sure I'm not going to find exactimate. Pretty sure I'm not going to find according to this price schedule or this fee schedule. I'm not going to find um, only if you use our vendor. None of that is in here because it doesn't exist. So we operate in a world where we we are follow we find ourselves following rules that no one wrote down anywhere. These are just common rules, like just, just common knowledge that we end up following without really any idea of how we got there, right? So there's no requirement to use Xactimate. There's no requirement to how to use Xactimate. We have just all somehow colluded together that Xactimate is the thing. Indoctrinated. Indoctrinated. Yes, we've been indoctrinated and we've been whipped. We've been beat down. Um, over the years by people who don't have our best interest in mind. The adjuster is not there to help us make money or make a living. The adjuster really isn't even there to make their policyholder whole. The adjuster's job is to pay as little as possible for the claim. As long as the, as long as the insured doesn't come back and ask for more money, they've done their job. As long as the insurer doesn't sue them, the adjuster has done their job. It doesn't matter to them. There's no calculus like that, that says, you know, did we make this person whole? No. The only question in their mind is, did they go away? Did we write a big enough check for them to go away? That's why you see early on in, in, in major claims, you'll have, you'll have adjusters send out checks right away. And it'll be like, it'll be 150 grand. And, and a lot of people were like, man, that's a lot of money. Thanks. And they'll never call the insurance company back. But most of them don't understand that 150 grand is probably on a $200,000 loss or a $300,000 loss, right? They're, the adjuster, it's just, it doesn't matter which company you're talking about. Their first blush, their first offer is going to be 40, 50, 60 cents on the dollar. And you know insurance companies have the data to understand. They can look at pictures, they can look at measurements, and they know right away what the loss probably is. And then they go, okay, if, if, if this is a $100,000 loss, we're going to throw 50 at them and see what happens. And then we're going to make them fight for another 10. And we're going to make them fight harder for another 10. And, and that's the game. Welcome, welcome to my life, right? As a, as a public adjuster, that's the fight I fight every single day. Uh, I got, I'm going out to a major loss next week, meeting a state farm guy. And, you know, he's already talking to, before I got hired, he's already talking to the insured and saying, and the insured saying, well, the tree hit my chimney and the chimney's like this. I think I'm going to need a new chimney. And the, the adjuster is already saying, oh, no, you don't need a new chimney. Don't you don't so. need that. We can, we can just push that back to you. And well, I don't know what he said, but something to the effect of you, we're not going to pay for a new chimney. He's already decided this and he hasn't even seen the loss. So that's, that's where we're at. Hey, Jennifer, your name came up several times in conversation over the last couple of weeks. Oh, what did I do? Well, just there's there's a lot of people out there with a lot of insurance questions, workers comp questions and things like that. Sure. Sure. Um, Max actually mentioned your name to Max, who is here. He's out of California, who is looking at it's a great question. I think it's a great question for the group. Right. We had Max is, hasn't started his restoration company yet. He runs a construction company. Okay. And I said, you should probably run two different two different companies. Hmm. Don't run a restoration company you know, slash construction company. You should have a, a 
one LLC and you know, a restoration company having a different LLC. What are your thoughts on that? What what do you what's good, bad, and indifferent? I'm gonna disclaim this with I'm not an attorney and I don't set up LLCs sure, sure, or sure. corporations to determine what would be most advantageous for you because tax world and insurance world are completely different. Right. So there's a reason why people put things together for tax purposes. And there's a reason why they separate it. In regards to putting entities together, um, oftentimes they put it together because it's the, um, the ownership is the same. It's not like you can just put businesses together. If, if, if Max owns a donut shop, but he also has a construction company, he just can't arbitrarily go to his insurance carrier and say, hey, I own both of these companies. I want to put them together. They have no interest and identifying a donut shop. <laughs> they might only have an appetite for construction. So that's not an option. In the case of fire water restoration contractors, most of the times they do own the same company. So sometimes it's not advantageous uh, to keep them separate because then you're paying two separate premiums. Mm. Um, but the only but thing is, is when you put the companies together, what you do have to realize is that you're now sharing those limits. So, yeah. uh, but there are also a lot of other things you have to think about. When you put those companies together, sometimes they don't like it that you're sharing employees. Mm. So they don't necessarily, um, the insurance company doesn't have an appetite that Max is a construction company and he likes doing roofing also. Uh, they'll go ahead and let you put the liability together if it's the same ownership, but they don't want to be on the hook for the workers' comp that includes a class code for roofing. So mm. they're going to try to, you know, say, no, we don't want it. Um, and then if you are trying to put yourself in a fire, water, mold, lead, asbestos program like ours, where you get the GL, the pollution, the professional some contents, a little bit of inland marine, you know, all that different coverage. You have to have a percentage of operation that is specifically focused or looks like you are to actually fit in this program. So that's why they don't like carpet cleaners. They don't, they no. don't really want to get in bed with carpet cleaners. They want to see some environmental exposure because the package is meant for that. So if hmm. Max says, okay, we're going to do 2 million. I'm a contractor and I do 2 million. And he starts talking too much and starts saying, well, you know, 75% of my business is construction. They're going to be like, well, thanks. Let me sell you a separate pollution policy because sure. we don't want you in our program. Sure. Because there's more liability. Well, the bottom bottom line is you've you've got to shop it out, and you've got to whatever you do, you've got to go in with your eyes wide open and and educate yourself as much as possible. Sure, because if you buy a standard general liability policy as a contractor, and then you're trying to do some of this kind of work, any local agent is going to be like, "Oh, great." I already have your general liability. I'm going to sell you a separate pollution policy. And then I'm going to sell you a separate professional liability policy. And then I'm going to sell you a separate contractor's equipment policy. And now this is where the big problem happens when you have it separate and you really are a restoration guy. Let's say you go in there, you get the call and you're not in charge of stopping the source of the moisture, but you're in there to do the dry out. And then after you do the dry out, the guy likes you so much. They're like, Okay, you can do the come the back and do the repairs, the mm -hmm. remediation, and then they like you so much they're going to let you do the build back. Now you have a claim. Now a year later, the lady's like, uh, 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 "I smell mold. Mm -hmm. I can't breathe." Wow, when those people were here, they said they got all the moisture out, but I don't think so. And they go over there and they open up that wall and they say moisture. Any general liability policy has what they call a total pollution exclusion. That means anything to do with a liquid, solid, or gas is not covered on your liability policy. So now you've got to your company and you're like, hey, this lady from last year, she says she smells mold. I need to put in a claim. She's crazy. You go to your GL carrier, you pay your deductible. They have a duty to defend you. They say, okay, we open the claim. They find out there's mold. It's excluded. 
So now you go over to your pollution carrier. You're like, hey, lady says she smells mold. I think there is. They go, okay, well, we're going to pay to do the remediation and get rid of the mold. But by the way, your policy doesn't cover professionals. So we're not going to do that. Mm. Um, and now you have two separate claims, two separate deductibles. They're both supposed to be representing you, but they're fighting over what part each one of them want to pay. Mm -hmm. So right. sometimes it's not advantageous to have all these separate little policies just because when you have to really pull the trigger, you want a one stop shop. Okay. Now, are you mentioning like, uh, you know, um, environmental and GL and professional liability? Is it, do you feel that, have, or is it advantageous for us to, um, like, you know, insurance as well, since we're being considered professionals and we do sometimes make mistakes and maybe we don't quote. Well, absolutely. It, it's E and O and professional liability are the same thing. I feel like I always have to say that because people don't know. Errors in omission is to make an error or admit you screwed up, like my bad. You gave bad advice. You, whether it was you didn't mean to or you did it on purpose, you did it on purpose. The character's going to tell you it's bad, right? That's just, you did bad business. But if you, you know, incidentally gave bad construction advice or consulting advice and you're like, nope, that wall's good. There's no water in there. We don't need to dry out over there. We're good. It's right here. You gave bad advice. That's covered under your errors and omission or professional liability. But keep this in mind. If you are an accredited IICRC accredited uh, person doing this work, you're required to be carrying e o or professional liability because that's considered an educational edu educational institution. So you know, you, funny. I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's funny you mentioned that because I was, because since I run, you know, I do kind of what Andy does right in estimates. I wanted to get, be accredited with the ICC. They told me they are, they don't require professional, they require general liability insurance to be an accredited entity with their, with the ICRC, not professional. But I'm sorry, you're telling me that you wanted to be accredited through the IICRC. And they are requiring, before you can get accredited, they're requiring GNL or GL. Not professional, because I was like, I, I have professional. Yeah, because you're not a professional yet. You only become a professional once you're educated. And then you're I giving. Have, I, ha I do have multiple certifications. I mean, be from like other employees that are still active and all. But for my company itself to be accredited, I have to start with GNL. Like they never said anything about professionals. I mean, you might be right. I'm not Again, because they're not observing though any of your education through their institution. So that's probably why. But if okay. you're just, if you're a guy and you're going to go get your WRT starting out, IICRC is not going to require that because you're not considered a professional consultant or expert. It's kind of like people who carry professional liability or e &O, they're CPAs, they're lawyers, they're doctors. They're public they're, adjusters. Well, like adjusters, insurance brokers. You're paying for my opinion. Doesn't matter if I give you bad advice or not, but if I hear me out, here's another thing that you guys don't all realize. When you give good referrals, I like to say referrals, or you're like, Hey, we don't build patio covers, but my guy, Joey, he does patio covers. He's great. And Joey shows up on the job and he takes his deposit check for 20 grand and he leaves and goes to Hawaii. And that customer comes back and goes, you, you told me to use Joey. You just gave a professional opinion that Joey was the guy. So you could actually have your insurance trigger to have to defend you because you gave a professional opinion. So sometimes- How many times have you seen that? Never. Okay. Okay. So it's, but, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a maybe. Okay. It's a maybe never, but there, there is a situations like you should kind of be like, Hey, I can tell you to use this guy, but keep in mind, he has nothing to do with me. Like I'm going to give you two other guys too. I really like Joey the best, but CYA. We actually had that happen to me when I was at Rotor Rooter. We had, it tested hot for asbestos and we had, we, one of our guys recommended a local abatement company. They came in and messed it all up. And the lady came after us because we gave the reference for them. And they, they, they pretty much didn't put proper containment up and 
got asbestos dust everywhere in the house and they came after us. And after that point there, we were told, you, you look at it up in the phone book or, you know, don't give them, don't say, here's three references. Just say, if you need, if right. it's something yeah. that you're not going to be handling as the company, like you're not going to pay the bill and like off the record, you know? Yeah. So. Off, yeah. Yeah. How, yeah, how did that claim it up? How, did your carrier have a duty to defend you and did they? And how did, what ended up happening? I mean, it was a proto rooter on a corporate level. So I'm assuming they had the right people in place, but yeah, I mean, it was, she was, I mean, obviously they were mad because the whole house had to be recleaned and everything else. And well, they were just the, looking for deep pockets, they named everything. Yeah, I mean, I, we were a all, lot, you guys like they were fishing. You're completely innocent, you weren't even there that day. And when you agree on a certificate of insurance that you're gonna hold them harmless, you're saying no matter what happens, I wasn't there that day, mm -hmm. we were all there that day, I was upstairs, he was downstairs. If you agree on the COI to hold harmless, that means no matter what, it's going to be your policy that triggers. It's going to be your fault. So mm. tread lightly when you issue those COIs. All the customers want to be indemnified. Of it's course. Especially the GPAs. None so, of them want to pay for it either. I always told, tell them to look it up in the phone. If you're not going to hire it for your, for the, through your company and they're going to be a sub, don't give them like three options. Don't say here's three options because they're giving three professional options. Just say, look it up in the phone book, look it up on Google. You need an abatement company once you get one, you know, and take it and it's done. Then you can call us back out if we need to, but don't, you don't even give them business cards or say here's three choices because that's still considered a professional reference. Yeah, Unless you're just- That's hard. Like, no. That is hard. So Jennifer, what events, um, if guys are going to go to events this year, what events are they going to see you at? Well, are you, you, are you going to every single one of those that you listed down last week? <laughs> are you? Most likely, most likely. Um, yeah, God, that's know, a long list. Um, I try to thread the needle because I am all about protecting you guys and not get screwed over. Um, you know, there are some good things about TPAs. I said it. Um, Uh-oh. Not about how they screw you guys. Um, <laughs> The, the one thing I like about it is they do kind of try to get everyone together. So they do do that. Uh, the yeah. other thing is, is they really help to legitimize the industry and okay. keep your know, fans, carpet cleaners out. Um, but they do kind of set the bar pretty high so that you guys are considered specialty contractors and you get the credence that you deserve. So in that matter, you know, we have, you guys all know this. There's a lot of guys out there that are saying they're duck cleaning or they could do mold remediation. They don't have the accreditations. They don't even know how to spell pollution. And they're your competition. So there's a lot to be said to be able to say like, well, I'm accredited. I have these, you know, I have these skill sets and these classes under my belt. So I like that part because they do require very stringent insurance guidelines to cover you for the work you're doing in the event you have a claim. So in that matter, they're the only ones that are babysitting what kind of insurance you guys should have yeah. for that. Um, but the shows that I really like are the ones that don't have an agenda specifically to how they can screw you over. So uh, I've, got, like I've got IAQA on February 19th and 20th in Austin. Uh, Nexus... I would I would say Nexus probably doesn't have as big of agenda, correct? Right. That's uh in at the in Las Vegas at the Mirage on twenty seventh of March. Okay. Rams. Uh, and then the RIA is the April twenty fourth and twenty sixth in Orlando. That's a great show. That's made up of jet restoration. Uh, you know, just restoration guys. Uh, May, uh, the experience in Broward, Florida, May eighth and through the tenth really uh, love the experience because they embrace all associations that are part of the industry um they have no loyalty to any of them i don't believe um so they invite everybody iaqa iicrc ria they invite the tpas they you know they invite crawford lackerty lionsbridge god bloom so the experience they, has two shows a year so the first one is on May 10th in Broward, Florida. The second one is September 6th uh, in Vegas. Um, and then there's Where's my national, Midwest at? The who? Midwest, Midwest ones. Uh, the, no one does anything in the Midwest. You know like this. 
Yeah, you could come to New Orleans for Crawford. Uh, Crawford is in New Orleans. I didn't even write that down. Um, so for new guys, Max, since you're here, I would highly recommend checking out either the Mar the Nexus uh, event at the Mirage in Las Vegas on the 27th of March. Um, the RIA, if you can make it all the way to Florida, that'd be a good one to attend. It's a great show. Um, That'll be the April 24th through the 26th, I'll be exhibiting at that show. Um, it's Orlando, Florida. What's the deal with the national disaster experience? You said that's a big question mark for you. You don't know about that yet. Have you been? I went a couple of weeks ago. It looked okay. like it was really trending on national disasters mm. on a big scale. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure. It's a it was a very expensive show. Uh, they're going to do it again in Anaheim, California next year. Um, I think they did it in January or uh, December. December, is that when I went? Oh. Uh, but I like the experience because they flip flop on both sides of the continent. So they give a chance for the guys on the East Coast to go to the one in Florida and then they do it in Vegas every year in September. Okay. Um, and it's, I like that show a lot because it gives the owners a chance to bring their technicians. Uh, it kind of gets, it engages the techs. It lets them see all the newest equipment. It lets them see some of the newest technology, some of the new safety features. Uh, the hotels are less expensive. And I think you get to walk the floor for free. So that's nice. why I like the experience. Okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna spend a little time browsing the, the uh, Restoration Rebel feed here to see if we can answer any questions there. Um, no, I don't have a good question for that. No, need an attorney to foreclose on a lien in the state of Texas. All right, good luck. I'm All sure right. some, someone will answer that question. Uh, would a heavy cleaning of a driveway after a fire fall under the other structures section? I would say no. I would say the uh, gr the driveway is part of the structure, part of the dwelling it's not other structures, in my opinion, because usually it's connected directly to it's usually a, the same slab that goes into the Andy, driveway. Andy, if I can hit on the driveway thing real quick. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay, cool. So I have been seeing a lot of claims on driveway situations. Um, a lot of the smaller shops don't have commercial auto or business auto with a million dollar limit. They're using like their one truck. Uh, it's a personal truck, F-250, 350, and they don't have commercial auto. Um, tread lightly on that, y'all. One, mm. number one, is if you're driving in that personal vehicle, change it over to the company name so that you can protect that corporate veil. And if you're letting anybody work for you and they are a one-stop shop, like a one-man show, and they don't have commercial auto, tread lightly on letting them pull up on your customer's property. Mm. If they don't have commercial auto, you probably should just go ahead and tell them that they can't park on that property. Okay. We see a lot of stains on beautiful $20,000 white concrete or broken tiles or, you know, uh, the carpet cleaner guys or, you know, their, their truck leaks. No offense. Uh, yeah. That's very uh, common. Very so common. Be, be very cognitive of that driveway also, I see a lot of situations with the pods. Uh, if you're doing the pack outs and you're putting the pod on the driveway and you're trying to make your tin and tin off that pod, it might not be worth it. Those guys are slamming those pods down on the driveway when they're delivering them. And you're the one that's trying to make your 10% and trying to you know, pass it through the company to make that 10%, not worth it. Just give that phone number to the, your client and let your client call so when they do Crack the driveway, delivering it. It's not your insurance. Well, the other side of that is is you've got to do take good. You, you got to take care of the client too. So, it, with dumpsters or pods, put down some wood. Put down some OSB or or whatever else to Ribbit. protect the driveway. Charge for that. Right. Um, but you know, just anticipate these things. And right. if you've got a, you know, I've, I've had a more than one claim when I was working in the field for 
you know, people saying, well, your, your truck dripped oil on my driveway. Now my driveway is stained. All the time, you guys. Take uh, pictures. All take the pictures, time. Take pictures. Take pictures. Uh, so, yeah, it's just about, it's about situational awareness. And, right. and anticipating. Or just don't park in the driveway. Just, just don't park in the driveway. Your guys are not allowed to park in the driveway. So this, this question from Kevin really, I mean, I, I tend to lose my shit when people ask this, but Hey, this is the world we're in. No, no offense, Kevin, but would anyone by chance have a breakdown of each line item we are able to charge for on jobs that are, that they are willing to share, willing to pay for it. I'm just needing someone, something to gauge off what I would find and not trying to miss anything, trying to avoid buying a month's access to Xactimate. So, uh, second, my second answer was pay someone that has Xactimate to come up this, what this come up with this for you. And, but my first reaction was there's, there's no such thing as a list of things we can and cannot charge for. Uh -huh. And <sighs> if you are relying on an insurance or, or relying on an estimating platform to uh, build your service list, uh, maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and and figure out what kind of business you want to be in. It's not what you can and can't charge for. It's what needs done and what you do do that you charge it's, for. It's what, exactly. what needs to be done and what you actually do. Exactly. Now, Andy, I, I tagged you in a post. This post is not actually part of the Rebels group. It was part of Ninja or Exactly Ninjas, but it's one that I think you should talk about with the group because it was a very, the, the situation is is kind of, crappy <laughs> the question of it is um check it out if you don't mind um i think i tagged you in the post on it you'll see me because i know you're on ninjas as well okay read, here read we go this. water water mitigation and jester sends me this this would be the first i heard that basements weren't covered okay concrete holds moisture in its natural state therefore drying of concrete is not billable horseshit any moisture in the concrete would dry out with the residual air movement prod, prod by the perimeter air movement, whatever that is. Per the photos, the flooring is concrete surface, which would not require additional air movement applied to it. Bullshit. Any moisture on a concrete would dry out with the residual air movement. I don't know what that pre RLD produced, produced by the perimeter. Uh, interesting. I'm trying to tell this lately. I've never ever been told that basements weren't covered, so I'm confused. How would I even argue this? Photos. Uh, the admins made me remove the photos link. So unfortunately, you can't see the extent of what I'm talking about. But what I can see standing water. She said um, in the comments that it was a main sewer line backup or probably okay. most likely a soft clog resulting in an overflow, not a backup. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but this needs to be extracted. And yeah, he's not wrong in saying that concrete does have moisture, uh, elevated moisture in it, in its natural state, especially basements. You know, it's going to absorb a certain amount of moisture from the ground, but um, telling them not to use additional air movement in order to get that back down to an equilibrium level is bullshit. Right. Just because it has a 30 to 40% moisture content doesn't mean there's not a dry standard for concrete. There is if a dry standard over... for concrete. Yep. Try it, you can overwet it. Plain and simple. And yeah. I was I was flabbergasted to even hear about that. I and all. Yeah. And I like what Gabe said here. Does the insurance policy state that? Yeah. Show me the policy provision. Sure. Um just you know, remember, Bugs, when you're looking at the policy, if it's if not excluded, that, it's included. If it's not excluded, it's included. Just keep okay. saying that to yourself. If it's not excluded, it's included. Okay, uh, another one here, different group, but uh, I've always updated my Xactimate scope of work to the month that I'm getting paid. Normally, the price increases. Work was completed in October, but the carrier scope of work is set to September's price, not January, when they finally paid. Do mitigation scopes get their price list updated when paid, like the build back scopes for materials? And my answer was, services should be priced according to when they were provided. That's exactly how it doesn't... When you did the service, you signed a contract to do the work. You should have had a schedule of fees or a price list attached to that 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 work that authorization. Is. That's how you price it. You know, it doesn't matter if it takes you six months to get paid. You have a financing 
question, not a pricing question. You have a cost of money question, not not a pricing question. Yeah, and I would I'm a huge fan of late fees. Charge a late fee every month. I've always operated under the rule you estimate the month the claim was filed in or whenever you got your first call out on it. But if it's like a six month project, you update it not to the last of the month, the last the newest month, you update it to the pricing when the predominant amount of materials were bought in or services were provided in to capture the the um, the rise the well, I'm the word I'm, I'm losing the word here the um and the um the increase inflation the inflation prices of stuff because your estimate is an estimate this is what you think it's going to cost and then because of supplements and everything your final invoice should be based on what you actually spent and so I've always told everybody you estimate I always just estimated the month the claim was filed and then I final invoice in the month that I actually like I bought the predominant amount of materials or the predominant amount of the labor was completed in when it's like a four or five month project, because I'm probably gonna buy a bunch of this stuff on month three and, and then have to wait for it to get delivered and then it's gonna get installed later. So I would price sure. it for month three, not for month five when all the installation got finished because it was you know sporadically getting the stuff coming in and doing it. That's how I've always done it. I don't know if that's right. question. Or. Does the prices on Xactimate fluctuate throughout the year? Yeah. Every month. Every, oh really? I didn't know that. Oh, and by the way, Andy, this month, I just saw the price list. I haven't posted it on the groups. They added WTR and HMR confined space soda blasting. Interesting. Really? Okay. It's about time. It's about time. One of the things about the price list there, Max, is uh, the, the price list is an archived price list, stating that it's a past tense price list. This All is right. for information that might be 30, 60, 90 days old. So I, I do is I got a local lumber company here where I'm at in Washington, Idaho area. I have them price, send me uh, all their lumber pricing. They carry shingles, they carry lumber, they carry all kinds of stuff, things like That's that. That's a great idea. And I also monitor our uh, local area um, labor costs. I had an adjuster go, hey, you can get somebody hired for uh, $15 an hour, $10 an hour to do that work. You know, they're not professionals. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, labor starts in our area at anywhere from $19 to $22 an hour. And that's that's the guy that doesn't, never been trained in anything. They'll say, I don't want to say he doesn't know anything, but he's not been trained in and that's, anything that we do in our industry. That's, that's just, without yeah, burden. That's that's straight cost. That's that, That's without burden. Yeah, that's without anything. That's the cost of having him come in our door. That's what we're paying him right out of the gate. And keep in mind, folks, that the prime rate is now at 7.5%. It's up from three and a quarter to seven and a half in less than a year. So yeah, you also have to consider that. The prime rate is up. Thank you, Joe Biden. What, what if what if the material costs are a lot higher than what they have on Xactimate? Are you able to tweak those numbers if they're not correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Go into the component and manually yeah. input yeah. the price on it. You now. can do it on yeah. You can do it on an individual level. Uh, yeah, everything. And so everything it depends on your. It depends on your company and how you do things. Are you going to input the exact price from the store, or are you going to calculate your burden on burden on? Uh, you know, carrying the cost of that, uh, picking the materials up, all those things are factored in when I do my price list. Uh, I use a custom price list. It's not exact meets. No. They're, they're nowhere even close in our in our region. Well, what Andy, I will last week, Andy, or last couple months ago, Andy, you said use Xactimate and then add 1.3 to even come close to what you're really actually paying. Yes. Yeah, 1.3, and then you're still using 10 and 10 on top of that. So it's actually oh, 1.5. Yeah, wow. it's a 1.5 okay. factor. And I mean, for the two guys that are in the group that are TPA people, you know, don't buy into the fact that you have to stick to the default component price list either. Like, if you right. are somebody that works and, you know, works hand in hand and you work with your adjuster to reach a compromise, 
you know, if a light fixture and exact mates a hundred dollars and you go and the one the homeowner wants is like 120, you can update your price list and you're not as long if you're not going yes. more than like on average about 20 to 30 percent higher than the default price list, usually nobody will give you any kind of gruff for it whatsoever. But if you're getting estimating originally $112 and the homeowner wants to buy a $300 or $200 life fixture, that's when you got to start. That's when you got to stop and say, well, let's find out if they're going to cover this cost or if this is an out of pocket, you know, change order upgrade for you, because they do know that they, I mean, most adjusters accept that not everything is perfect pricing in the system, but you can't take advantage of it and get away with it at the same time. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, it, I mean, it is, I mean, there's something like, I mean, they give you like $112 for like a sink faucet. Most sink faucets and kitchen faucets right now are like 160 a pop, you know? Um, nine to 12, yeah. That's Midwest you know, pricing. So, yeah, well, but you know, I mean, that's the thing though, is like you Come should, <laughs> you don't have to do every, you don't have to go through your component list at the end of the job and, <laughs> and verify prices on every single thing, obviously. But your big ticket finished items, your faucets, your carpet, your floors, things like that, you should be updating the component price on it. And what I like to do is I'll just go to the like the Lowe's website, find the price, copy that website link and add it to the F9 note. And when you send that PDF over to your adjusters, that in with the update pricing, you know, the F9 note reads pricing updated to match market value. That's all you need. That link is active and they can click on it through your PDF that you email. Yeah. And go straight to the website and validate that you're actually yeah. telling the truth and you're not. Very, yes. very hard to argue with that. Very hard to argue that. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up against our time, but yeah, I, one more question for you, Jennifer. I'm looking for a new insurance company for my restoration and construction company. We are based in Missouri, eight employees, 1.5 million in, in, in sales. We pay 26 grand a year for our commercial package, including auto, uh, plus 775 a month for workers' comp. Um, wow. How does that sound? Call 714-767-3687. Boom. Boom. There we go. Um, yeah, we're going to call it. Forward me that, Andy. I didn't see that. Forward it. How I'm about I kidding. tag you in it? Hold on a second. Here we go. Here. I'm going to do at Jennifer Marie. No. That's it. Okay. I'm on the slide. But you've got a badge. Is it a badge here? We just had a fallen officer that was shot on a traffic. Yeah. There we go. Uh, there we have it. All right. Well, this is cool. We had six people instead of two, which is nice for a change. Yeah. <laughs> I still, Mitch, your mask thing just freaks me out. My what thing? Mitch's face screen. It's just. Hey, man, let me tell you, unless you I got the jab it. or the jab in the jab in the jab nine times in a row. That's how I keep away all that stuff from infiltrating my family's life, you know. And if if it filters out on the liberal stuff. Yeah, said to the girl who went to jail for not wearing a mask. Did you go to jail? <laughs> oh, like, no. I thank you. So you. they tried that. Oh, I was kicked out about it every story oh, possible. No. But, it uh, it I'm, took uh, eighteen law enforcement officers, a SWAT team, two helicopters, and a paddy wagon. To get you in the in the in the back of the car? No, I no, just that's what it, it was a big showing. It was a big deal. They're trying to make a you know a statement. Oh, yeah. so I live here in Idaho. I don't know if you've heard of the hardware uh, brewery. Um, no. So they tried to shut them down, and they were you know here in Idaho, kind of partial to your American rights. Mm-hmm. So weird. They tried to they come in to try to shut them down and the whole town kind of filled up the local area. The guy came in with this piece of piece of paper and they pretty much good uh, said he yeah, left. Those are those are some of my people. Good. He, he left. <laughs> He's he lucky left. he didn't get beat. <laughs> you have to look it up. It was online. Uh, it was oh no, I saw it. Break. No, those at those my girlfriend runs a group out there. So yeah, I know. Uh so yeah. next week, uh, I'm not gonna be here. So if someone wants to step up and volunteer, um, I'll hand over the reins and you guys can run uh, and run the Zoom yourselves. Where are you going? Hmm? Where are you I, going? I'm, I'm, I got to meet an adjuster on a large loss. Okay. Well, yeah. I got I to gotta make my client some money. It's going to be 300 grand. And, and the adjuster thinks it's going to be 150. So we're going to have a brawl. I'm going to bring my boxing gloves. 
Come on, I'll let you borrow mine. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate getting the opportunity to just talk about the shows that um, everyone should be trying to at least try to go to one of them. Yes. And I do, I do think it's important that you find a show where you can bring your tick, your tax, because mm -hmm. it really does make them feel like they're part of the bigger picture, you know, yeah. not just going out and stopping, you know, dirty water. I agree. I agree. Um, it's a really good chance to network. They can take their IICRC classes. Uh, for the owners, some really great uh, speakers that talk about, you know, how to run your businesses. So I, I would look at all of those shows and figure out which one's a good fit. And I think it's important that we support these shows because it is nice to have, you know, be collaborative, you know? Yeah, I agree. Which one, which ones would you recommend to go to like first, first on the list? Cause I'd probably make it to like one or two, maybe Nexus so. and RIA. I, I, yeah. I'd say RIA and Vegas. I, I would, the experience, like I said, Nexus and the experience uh, and the RIA, I, I'd say like, if you can make it to Vegas, everybody will go to Vegas because it's something fun. The rooms are inexpensive. You could probably, flights are pretty cheap. You could drag a few people along with you. And like I said, you can walk the exhibit floor for free and you can bring as many people as you want. So if you're just trying to get your feet wet and try to like not dump five grand because it, you know, shows are expensive. I mean, every show I do costs me between five and $7,000. Yeah, that's easy. That's, uh, you know, and are we still going to crash that Sir Pro event? Yeah, for sure. No, let's do it. Let's make it happen. When is that? When is that? I didn't get a date. I didn't throw it down. We'll talk about that later. Send me a text. Send me a text. All right. All right. Um, also, by the way, if if you can't always make it to these conferences, there are a few that are digital, like uh, the experience, which is Verse 6. That's a completely web-based. You can join up for free and go to that one there, and they do a few training courses. If you virtually sign up, you get to join like one or two training courses. Uh, virtually as well okay nice all right rebels so if i look that up other. i'll find it under the experience yeah. hey max just call me 714-767-3687 i'll hold your hand i like the new guys because then you you learn the right way not to what were the last digits sorry 3687 say it again i'm going to put it in the chat here 714-767-767 <laughs> And her phone never stopped ringing. <laughs> That's true. There it is. <laughs> just right. be glad if you're if you think I'm a good fit for you. It's just brutal honesty, no bullshit. I really can't play with stupid anymore. I'm getting too old, so no. I'm just gonna no get you guys stupid. where you need to be. All right, be good, y'all. We'll see you God next bless week. Y'all, happy New Year. Right. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year.